Hello and welcome to Resourceful, stories from the site, proudly brought to you by Resources Unearthed. At Resources Unearthed, we help executives, professionals and business owners in mining and resources to be successful both personally and professionally. We've created this podcast to help you in your employment or business, and we'll be chatting to people who have a proven track record of success in the industry. Thanks for joining us. I'm James Marshall from Resources Unearthed and welcome to today's episode of Resourceful. Today we're chatting with Ian Goodwin, a man full of experience, enthusiasm and great stories. Ian has consulted as an executive coach and mentor within the mining and resources industry for over 30 years and shares some valuable insights for you to take back to the site. He emphasises the importance of surrounding yourself with mentors for all aspects of your life be it your career, your personal life, or any other area you want to grow in. Ian also touches on how networking is not just for work events. Constant networking through LinkedIn, face-to-face meetings, or the method that suits you is invaluable as this builds your team of potential mentors, team members, or future employers. Hi. My name is Brett Cribb, Managing Director and Founder of Resources Unearthed, and welcome to Resourceful Stories from the Site. Today I'm joined by Ian Goodwin. Ian has a lifetime of experience and is highly regarded as a mentor to many leading executives and business owners across the resources industry. As someone who is greatly respected for his sage advice, he's regularly called upon to assist both large and small resources companies. So today, Ian and I will explore some of his most memorable stories from the site. So wherever you are, sit back, relax, and enjoy the first in our series of Resourceful podcasts. Ian, welcome to Resourceful. It's uh, great to have you with us today. So um, I thought I'd get started. And to start with, for the benefit of our listeners, can you give us a brief overview of your career and, and where you've come from? Sure, Brett. First up, uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to do this podcast. Uh, I've been looking forward to it and um, I'm sure we'll have some fun along the way here. It's great um, to have you here. Yeah, my, my, um, I served an apprenticeship in Scotland and I had a school teacher who was Australian. And ever since uh, the early age of probably about 10 years, I've always thought about Australia. I thought I really want to come to Australia. Um, I finished my apprenticeship, um, we were then, I won the apprenticeship of the year, the apprentice of the year for the whole of the UK and the opportunity for me to travel was presented by British Leyland who was the company that I served my apprenticeship with and I was due to come out to Australia with them. Uh, unfortunately four weeks before I was about to arrive, Leyland Australia went bankrupt and for those of the old fogies you'll remember the Leyland P76. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because my parents had a Leyland P76 as a car when we were at school. <laughs> well that's the one that sent them bankrupt. <laughs> that's it. So I had made up my mind like four weeks before I had an air ticket I had the whole lot I thought this is it. I really want to get to Australia. As luck has it every day I would pull in a newspaper shop and get the newspaper going to work. And for this day in particular, unbeknownst to me, I got an English newspaper. Why I got an English newspaper, I've got no idea. So in this newspaper was an advert from Hammersley Iron, which is now Rio Tinto in the northwest of Western Australia at Dampier. And they were looking for fitters to come out in a two-year contract. So I cut the bed out, went home, did the writing as you did in these days, sent off and got the job. The rest is history, basically. So came out, the idea was for two years. Worked up in uh, Dampier as a maintenance fitter uh, on the diesel locomotives. And um, the average length of stay for a single person in the Northwest at that time was eight weeks. Mm. I'd been there for two months and I'd calculated out, okay, I've saved a lot of money. I've got a lot more money than I had coming out. And I can go back and I can do this after 10 weeks. I thought, oh no, I'll just stay another couple of weeks. So, stay another couple of weeks and I got another paycheck. And I thought, nah, I think I'll stay another two weeks. So, I just went on for a year. Yeah. And I became the, the longest person in history, single person to be up in the Northwest. So, I went to my boss and I said, look, 
you know, I wouldn't mind seeing the rest of Australia. And they said, okay, said, what do you want? And I said, well, you know, maybe can I get six or eight weeks that I could and then come back? And he goes, tell you what, we'll give you a year's leave of absence. Yeah. So I had a year. So I traveled around Australia. Yeah. So in that time, I decided that I was going to head back to Scotland at the end of it, just to see what well, was my two years up, just to see what it was going to be like. And I got back, the only, the only, it's all fate, the only ticket I could get, or the cheapest ticket, was a return airfare, as opposed to a single. A single way was more expensive. Yeah. Singapore Airlines. So I went back to Scotland. Sitting down with my dad, went into the old uh, place where I worked, got my job back if I wanted it, sat down with my dad, and I said, ah, you know, and he says to me, he says, son, I don't know what you're doing here. And I thought, neither do I. Yeah. Two days later, I used the second part of my return ticket and came back to Australia. Back oh, up right. north for another, another 12 months. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, and, that, and this, was, this was in the mid 70s. So this was quite heavily industrialized, unionized um, yeah. environment I was in. So there's a number, lot of strikes that went on in these days. So I, I, um, I stayed there for another three years and it was a, quite a significant uh, strike on like you could almost tell it was live, living 12 weeks this is what they're talking about yeah so I'd been going out with a school teacher at the time and she lived in Esperance down the southwest of Western Australia and her parents were farmers so during the strike I went down there and set, caught with her brothers and I was used to the farm in Scotland so I ended up doing a bit of farming there for for a couple of months when the strike was on yeah so the, the two boys, the twins, are still good mates of mine. They said, uh, why don't you chuck it in up there and come and do some share farming? So I went down to Espens, completely got away from the trade altogether and, and yeah. did some share farming. Mm. And then um, I was trying to buy some uh, conditional purchase land down there. Couldn't do that because um, it was local farmers that got first preference and I wasn't a local farmer, so I just kept missing out. So I decided that I was going to go back to the city and uh, went up to Perth and uh, got a job with um, Mount Newman Mining, which is now oh, wow. BHP. Mm. So I resumed my, uh, my career and of course, 32 years later, I retired from BHP. Still there, yeah. Still there. <laughs> Still doing some work for them. <laughs> yeah, so that was a bit of a, was a, bit of a, a, bit of a change in the middle there. Um, yeah. I enjoyed it, the share farming. Actually, because they're new land farmers down there, they didn't have much money. So I ended up doing repairs on their equipment for them. Mm. So I was getting money from that as well as they'd give me a tractor to go and do some ploughing or do whatever, and then I'd put in a crop. So that was, yeah. that was good, good experience. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Eh? Yeah. So um, perhaps could you tell us a bit more about um, how you progressed and, and where you are now and the skill sets that led you to that position? Yeah. What, uh, when I joined um, Mount Newman or, or BHP, as we know them now, that was in Perth, and I was employed as a, a mechanical inspector. So what that meant was that when the equipment came down from the north to get repaired, my role was to uh, inspect it, make sure it was up to standard, and it was fit for purpose when it went back to the site. So I did that for about a year, and then I was asked if I'd be interested in uh, going up to site to Newman and being a foreman up there. So I did, I was up on site. So I was a foreman there for uh, 18 months, I used to whine and complain about supply, about warehousing and purchasing. Yeah. Like I was, I was just a whiner. Parts were never there, you know, all this kind of stuff. You it know. sounds like typical every, maintenance. It sounds like every operating site that I can remember. Well, it's, you you can relate to that, <laughs> bit, I'm sure, because it, but it was very typical. So I think they get sick of me whining about it, and they said to me. Because uh, I said I thought I wouldn't mind. I was single at the time. I thought I wouldn't mind getting back to back to Perth at some point. And I said, okay, we got a job in Perth. It's a supply superintendent, and it's looking after the what we call the direct charge purchasing activities, so the the ad hoc stuff. Would you be interested? And I said, sure. And I said, also we're going to be buying some uh, new locomotives, and what we'd like is you to kind of manage the contract with that. Now I had no contract experience, no nothing, so I ended up going to tech and um, get my supply certificate, supply diploma and contract management certification, all that kind of stuff. So it was a bit of a change in career for me and I quite liked it, you know, I was, I was into did negotiation uh, courses and all that and it was, it was good, I enjoyed it. So, so I then became a supply person, yeah. uh, much the disgust of a lot of maintenance people. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
hopefully they got their maintenance equipment on time now. Well, well, well the thing was that they could actually talk to me and, and they weren't very good at writing stuff on paper, like what they wanted, but they could just phone me up and tell me, which, which was good, but it was also a bit of a pain. But anyway, I enjoyed it, you know, and it was dealing with people and I really, I, I, I got a buzz out of it. So I progressed through the supply chain. So I ended up being um, supply superintendent for the whole of the operation and then I got promoted to supply manager for BHP Manganese. Mm. So I was so just, in, just before you go any further, yep. at that stage, sort of how old were you at that stage? I was, uh, how old was I then? I would have been uh, 29. Wow. Yeah, yeah. probably wow. 29 then. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I got, um, I got the BHP Manganese Supply Manager's job, which meant I had to move to head office in Melbourne yeah. and then, and then uh, travel to Groot Island and these kind of places as well. When that happened, there was a guy at Newman, um, the name of Bob Kirkby. Bob set up this, or he, he, was, he was instrumental in, in setting up what we call the Global Maintenance Network. And what that was, was that Caterpillar, for example, um, you'd have an issue with a piece of equipment. And Caterpillar would say, oh, well, you're the only operating site that's got it. No other operating site has it. However, BHP wasn't very good in these days in communicate across each site. They all kept their own identity. Didn't, didn't isn't, that, isn't that called divide and conquer? <laughs> well, that's exactly. <laughs> and, and Caterpillar were masters at it. Yeah, that's you know? it. So um, Bob set up this, so I was, I was a maintenance guy, but then I had some supply stuff as well. So then I, I was on the original steering committee. So when, um, as, a, as a group manager, as a BHP uh, manganese supply manager, I did that for about another year, year and a bit, and then BHP bought um, the Magma Corporation in mm, the States. Yeah, yeah. The infamous, was, uh, infamous move. Yeah, yeah. We, we bought it at the highest price that you could get, and then, uh, anyway, that's another historical <laughs> story. And so then I uh, moved to San Francisco. So I was married by then and uh, moved to San Francisco. And I headed up, I was the um, group supply manager for BHP Copper. So I looked after all the copper sites for supply. And I did that for two years. And um, I was then asked um, if I could go up to Yellowknife, which is where the Cathy Diamond Mine was under construction at that time if I could help them interview for one, a maintenance manager, and help them interview for a supply manager. So they had these candidates fly into Yellowknife and I flew up and chatted away to them. Anyway, I came back to San Francisco office and did up my notes and all that, and I said, look, we ha really haven't, I don't think these guys were, are capable. Um, very difficult place to attract people to, so we weren't getting the right caliber of people. So I said to my boss at the time, um, I said, look, you know, maybe we should look internal and see if we can convince people to move up to the Northwest Territories. Yeah. My, um, my old boss in Manganese, the guy by the name of Jim Rothwell, he was the president. He was then made president of Diamonds. Mm -hmm. He got a hold of me and he said, Ian, he says, I remember you said that you'd like to one day be responsible for supply and maintenance. I've heard that we haven't got good candidates up there, so I'm putting it to you now. How would you like to go up to Yellowknife and be the maintenance and supply manager? Wow. I said, well, I've got to talk to my wife about this one. Yeah. We're going to minus 40 degrees right. <laughs> to a remote place, and I'm in San Francisco right now. Surprisingly, she uh, loved the place. And Jim said to me, he said, look, he said, we really would like if you could give us a couple of years and maybe even three years. So I said, OK. I said, I'm sure we can manage that. Well, eight years later, we left. And during that time, I had a fantastic experience did the maintenance and supply during construction, moved into operations to maintenance and supply, and then I was the main manager, as they call them now, the general manager. And as I said, stayed there for eight years and then uh, moved to Brisbane. Can you tell us a bit about uh, an interesting time or a difficult time in your career and what advice you'd give your younger self? Yeah, I recall the period, um, again, at, at uh, Mount Newman Mining, when I was doing this transition from from maintenance into supply. I questioned myself whether this was the right thing to do, whether I was actually going to hamper my, my career from a maintenance perspective. Um, but I also weighed up that maybe, maybe I can um, enhance it by the supply side of it. I wasn't convinced internally in my own mind you know, that uh, this was the right way to go. 
But I felt as if it had, I'd done enough complaining um, and I'd been given the opportunity. So somebody had saw enough in me that, that perhaps um, you can make a career out of, out of supply. Um, at that time, uh, a reflection now, I, I wished I, uh, I had a mentor of some sort that could, I could talk to and go through that, um, have that process, have that discussion about, you know, should I, what's the ups, what's the downs, what's, you know, what's in it for me, what's in it for the company, that kind of thing. And then also um, have a bit of a network of, of people that you could, you know, just bounce all these ideas and see where, where a career could go. Mm. So I was in a little bit of uh, turmoil at, at that point. Um, when I look back now, for me, the advice would be, one is uh, get yourself a mentor. Um, and I've had a mentor, like from then on, I, I had a mentor, I had a number of mentors, people that I could uh, talk in confidence to, mm. people that I respected, people that had good life experiences from a career perspective as well as a personal perspective. And that stood me in good stead. And the other one that I'd encourage people to do is to, and, and a lot of the young ones do it nowadays, is network. But network across a number of, of areas. So personal development through career, uh, through social activities, um, but, but join, join sort of a networking. I know this, the social uh, stuff you get on the internet now, which I, I'm not good at, by the way, but um, you hear a lot about it. <laughs> but um, uh, the Facebooks and they're partly Facebooks for old fuddy duddies now. But anyway, uh, all that <laughs> kind it. of stuff is, you know, these kids can now use that stuff. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, that had, there's one thing early on in my, my days that somebody told me about was a BHAG. Yep. It's yep. a big, hairy, audacious go. Mm. And, and that was explained to me, uh, John F. Kennedy was probably the, the, the best one there. He, he wanted to put somebody on the moon but had no idea how that was going to happen. He had no idea, like, that he just said, go ahead and, and do that. The modern world today, uh, modern business world today, and the person that I do admire is um, the Qantas uh, CEO, Alan Joyce. Yeah. He, he had a bit of a BHAG. I keep looking for BHAGs, and he had this yeah. sort of a bit of a BHAG, and that was, he wanted to get a, a big airliner that was going to be running very, very cheaply, but carry a lot of people and get there quickly. Mm. Now, he told Boeing and he told Airbus, he said, go and make me one, basically. So they got their heads together and they've come up with aircraft we get today. We had the 380, now we've got the 787. They're finally tuning it now to, to meet different standards. So that was his, his BHAG. I had a, a BHAG, albeit a little bit, a little bit quirky, but um, before my ICATI days, I was on a project, it's actually in Brisbane here called Breakthrough Sourcing. And we had this presentation from a guy from a company called Northwest Diamonds, mm -hmm. Northwest Territory Diamonds. Now that was BHP. And this was in the exploration days when they were looking for the diamonds in the Northwest. And they had, they had basically, all they had was a camp, igloos. So you're at minus 40 degrees and you're living in an igloo. Mm. Canvas igloo, should I? qualify that one. Yeah, that'd be but, nice and warm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I thought when I listened to this guy and he's showing you the pictures of all this stuff and it's barren land, snow and all the rest of it. Only way in was by ice road or, or fly and ice road was only open for three months of the year and I thought gee I would like to go that. That was but I thought there's no chance. I, I can't see how I'd get there. Well look what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was in my mind and I was in San Francisco, the wonderful, glorious weather of San Francisco and here I am heading for... Uh... So my advice, network and grab yourself a mentor. Yeah, I must say, and it's certainly been something that I've always worked towards in our business and, and uh, my career and been very fortunate along the way to see a lot of um, work with a lot of resource professionals and executives and business owners in that space. And there are some phenomenal people around. So. Always stay on the lookout and uh, look out for those people, and and you'll be surprised. Most of them are willing to share with you and and work with you over time. And I can certainly count the numbers of mentors, including Ian here himself, and other other people, the great friends and colleagues that are invaluable to your career progression and 
and your questions along that way. Yeah, I can't, um, like the, the people I've found that mentors are more than willing to help you through your career and, and just, just life in general, you know, and, and you felt, you, you built a rapport that you were very comfortable. And to this very day, most of these guys are retired. I've got, they're very close friends of mine yeah, now. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and we share, still share a lot of things. So it, it's a, it's, for me, it's a lifelong uh, relationship. Yeah, well, that's probably like my, my trip to Yellowknife was uh, to go up and see an old mentor, <laughs> a very good friend and colleague of mine. So it's, uh, it's the, you keep these contacts and connections for a long period of time, and it's, it's a great, great, great experience. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so um, in probably, um, you know, maybe for my last question today is, um, you know, what's your, what's your most memorable or funniest story you can think of from your, from your time? Of working in the industry and what you're up to these days, or anything from that area. I uh, yeah, I have got a few funny ones. I was reflecting just um, when I, to do this podcast, and and the one that sort of sticks out, and the one that sort of gets a little bit of interest is that again, I was a supply manager for BHP Manganese. Uh, one of the operations was in Temco, which is down in Tasmania. It's a smelter, a metallurgical smelter. Uh, we had, BHP had a company called BHP Transport, so we had our own ships, and, and this particular ship was the Iron Baron, and it would take manganese from Groot Island up in the north, drop off some manganese ore at a company which we owned, AMCL, Australian Manganese Company Limited, in Newcastle. They made the um, dioxide for the batteries, and then it would carry on and it would drop off the rest of its load at um, um, uh, Bell Bay, sorry, yeah. Bell Bay, that's the name of it, and up in the Tamar River north of uh, Launceston there at Georgetown. And then it would carry on and go to Wyala and pick up some stuff, iron ore or whatever, and then, anyway, whatever it did. Anyway, on its way, it had a load of manganese, and it was at the mouth of the Tamar, at the north of Launceston, and it hit rocks, there was some rough sea, and mm. it hit rocks. Anyway, it disintegrated. Yeah. And the, uh, the fuel, the bunker fuel, all came out. Mm. So there's this crude oil flowing along pristine, beautiful countryside up there, absolutely gorgeous, and the wildlife. Mm. And one of the, the uh, birds, so to speak, that uh, got heavily contaminated were the penguins. Yeah. There were fairy penguins. There were mm. big colonies up there. So... I was, as I said, supply manager, and I was the first person to call to say, you got to get us some stuff. Yeah. And I'm going, well, what do we do here? So I had some colleagues, luckily in networking, I had colleagues in BHP Petroleum in Perth, and I phoned them up and I said, what do you guys do if you had bunker oil? It would, oh, we need all this. Long story short, we got, these guys sent us a whole heap of stuff. We mobilized lots of stuff. We mobilized every piece of equipment that could try and contain this oil mm. very quickly with Hercules aircraft and all that kind of stuff. We also got uh, specialist um, people in wildlife and how to decontaminate them. Anyway, we set up this uh, cleaning station at Georgetown. It was made up of little uh, pens, if you will, and in each of these pens where the penguins would, we could put penguins was different solutions. So they started off covered in crude. Mm. And by the end of the half a dozen pens, they were pretty clean and ready yeah. to be fed and felt good about themselves again. Mm. Um, I was in there helping yeah. and I was at the last station. So I'm doing the, almost the grooming, so to speak. So I'm kind of fine, fine tuning these little things. Well, by the time they got there, they were pretty cranky. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I always thought it. these are cute little penguins that waddled around, diddle, 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 you know, doing, the, doing, the, doing their own thing. Well, by the time this got to me, they were just spitting chips. They were <laughs> fed up with the world. They were fed up with me and all the rest of it. And they were biting the hell out of me. And, and I was stopping short of grabbing it by the neck and giving it a good <laughs> slap across the face. But these little suckers just did not let go. And even then, when I let them go, they'd come back and their heads would down and have a go at you. And I thought, I just did you a favour, but forgetting the fact that we, we didn't do them a favour, you know. Yeah. So that was a bit of a, I have a bit of a laugh at that one because, and people do, because it's really, it's not mining related. It's not my job description, but here I was in there scrubbing these things. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was a, a fun kind of 
fun kind of thing to do, but it was also you felt responsible for it. Yeah, yeah. But that was, that, you know, you talk about teamwork, that was, uh, it's amazing what community came banded together. Like we were expecting big backlash, you know, but all we got was praises because that we engaged these professional people. We had specialists on, on uh, coats for, for um, fairy penguins, penguins yeah. you know, specialists on how to dissolve crude oil without, you know, causing that further causing, damage, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. And we get really good kudos out of it. So mm. it, was, it was good. You felt good at, but at the same time, it was a bit sad that you actually caused it as yeah, well. Yeah, so. yeah. But worked worked as well yeah. as you could to fix the problem yeah. up. Yeah, no, it was real good, yeah. yeah. It's always the, always the measure of good business, how well you respond when you have a problem. Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got to fix. Yeah, it's a bit of satisfaction, you know. I was, I'm pretty, I was proud, and still am proud that I worked for BHP, but I was really proud that, that we could do something, you know. Mm. We caused it, but we actually did something that was going to yeah. improve it, so. Mm. So, Ian, I know there was a couple of things you, you'd like to tell our listeners about your experience with finances and finances and running your yourself over the years. So could you perhaps fill us in on what, you, what you're interested in sharing there? Sure, sure, Brett. Um, let me talk about um, in my early days, I was paid a salary and uh, my superannuation uh, was through BHP. I'd actually talked to a few people, um, I guess they're financial planners, but about BHP super and I was told it's one of the best in the business. So I thought that's great, I don't need to do anything else, I'll just keep contributing to, uh, to it. And my thinking then was that um, you have a pot of money when you come to retire, whatever age that is, it's all divvied up with how long you're going to, uh, how long you can think you're going to live for, and that becomes your pension. So really, if, if you get the timing right, you, you die the, la the day the last cent's yeah. gone. <laughs> well, that changed quite a bit when um, I was starting to get bonuses for shares, cash bonuses, shares, and then options, and I thought I need more professional advice. So. So I, I, saw, I went through a number of uh, financial uh, planners, so to speak. I didn't like the way that they were trying to sell me stuff. So I, um, I, a friend recommended uh, you, and you and your business. So that was when I got, I got the idea of, hang on, I can actually uh, still have my capital money uh, and get a bit of a pension off of that and, and um, grow my wealth. So that's really what, um, how I manage, I guess, manage my funds and, and still do to today. Mm. Yeah, it's been an interesting experience. I know uh, uh, Ian talked about a friend that, that uh, referred him to us and, and, and uh, that was actually two, two friends and they happened to be mutual contacts. So it just goes to show how, how small the, the industry is. Absolutely. Uh, it was quite, uh, as a little funny little quirk in there as well, uh, this, uh, this, this guy, um, uh, manager who reported to me at uh, Ikati and uh, he had never had a bonus before and um, he came to me and he said, Ian, he said, um, how do you divide your bonus up with your own people? And I said to him, I said, no, no, that's your bonus. They look after their own thing. Really? I says, oh yeah, that's yours. You do what you want to do with that. So I had a bit of a chuckle to that because that was me. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Oh, it's an interesting story, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been good. Yeah. Um, Ian, thanks so much for joining us today and for giving our listeners some insight into the life of a mentor and executive coach in the industry, in the mining and resources industry. And it's been great to have you here. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Thanks. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thanks for interviewing and, and um, I've enjoyed it. And I oh, hope uh, your readers, your listeners, should I say, get uh, something out of it. Uh, yeah. It's been fun doing it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Resourceful, stories from the site. We'll be back in a month with more tips and insight from our other industry leaders. We'd love to connect with you. You can find us on all the usual social channels and our website, resourcesunearthed.com.au. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favourite platform so you never miss an episode.